session is brachytherapy in cervical cancer will be dealt by dr sapnendu basu and the last session is management of other gynecological cancer that will be taken care by dr obhishek basu junior so without wasting much time i would like to invite dr shantam chakraborty to give his presentation dr shantam chakraborty please good evening am i audible yes clearly audible and uh, slides are visible yeah excellent so let's start off first of all thank you to the west bengal roi chapter for inviting me to give this talk and uh, also to all the students who have taken the time out on a weekend saturday to be present for this talk today my ambit is to tell you briefly about the management of endometrial cancers and this is the outline of the talk that i have been asked to tell you so as you can imagine this is quite extensive and today i will be focusing primarily on endometrial carcinomas not on endometrial sarcomas so this is something that i would like to tell up front let's start off first of all looking at the risk factors endometrial cancer is a cancer which has been known to be associated with estrogen for quite a long time as way back is in the 1950s and 40s people noticed that estrogen was a driver mechanism for this malignancy and gustav et al first proposed this as a driver mechanism because he noted the presence of endometrial hyperplasia in estrogen excess conditions like in some estrogen secreting ovarian malignancies presence of external estrogen supplementation and by work done on animal models he also noted a clear histological progression from complex hyperplasia to endometrial carcinomas based upon this work later on bockman proposed the classical two type or dualistic model of endometrial carcinogenesis the type 1 which accounts for around 70% of the patients was noted to be associated with increased estrogen levels with metabolic disturbances like obesity diabetes hyperlipidemia and hypertension while the type 2 was not associated with other issues it is very important to note that bockman's classification was actually based upon the pathogenesis not on the pathology but increasingly pathology was later on used to classify the endometrial cancers into two types and when we talk about the types of endometrial cancer these are the two types and on the rows you can see all the risk factors i will not go through them one by one for you if you wish you can take a look at the bockman's classification the important thing for you to understand is that the type 1 endometrial cancers are known to be associated with a estrogenic state and based upon the tumor characteristics type 1 is endometrial cancers typically present uh, with a longer duration of symptoms they are usually moderate to very differentiated adenocarcinomas are not always usually have a superficial invasion less common chance of metastatic spread have a higher degree of hormone sensitivity and associated with ovarian breast and colonic cancers later on based upon this classification certain characteristic mutations were also observed the most common of which is the p10 mutation in type 1 endometrial cancers type 2 endometrial cancers on the other hand are characterized by the presence of the tp53 mutation and recently increasing emphasis has been placed upon her2 amplification because it is also a part of therapy in the metastatic setting now this work was later on ver verified by multiple other authors and this is a series of case control and cohort studies which have been done which have evaluated the association of different things like age menopause oral contraceptive use smoking interestingly smoking if you must know seems to be having a negative association all of these studies collectively demonstrated that metabolic disturbances are common in type 1 endometrial cancers but type 2 endometrial cancers are not completely devoid of these associations and which brings us to the new classification of endometrial cancer so what are the limitations of this dualistic model 
first of all, it does not apply to patients who have hereditary cancers or Lynch syndrome. The association with risk factors is not absolute. Certain types of histologies like clear cell type or malignant mixed Mullerian tumors, also known as carcinosarcomas, cannot be accounted for by these histologies. They have an overlapping mutation profile, so it is not like they are completely separate biological processes. And of course, because if you rely on any pathological system like use of grade or architecture, there is an element of inter-observer variability. People have realized these limitations in the classification for many, many years. Later on, using data from the Cancer Genome Atlas of around 300 patients with endometrial cancer and using genome-wide mutation characterization, endometrial class cancers were finally classified into four broad categories of subtypes. The first type is known as the pole ultra-mutated subtype. Then we have the MSI instability or hyper-mutated subtype. And the next two are copy number low and copy number high. Of note, the copy number high is usually associated with the TP53 mutation. And this is the common seminal paper by Kandoth et al. that you should look at. All of my slides have the references of all the publications that are cited. So you can take a look at them at leisure. Now, what are the clinical presentation of endometrial cancer? The most common is presence of vaginal bleeding and concerning is presence of post-menopausal bleeding. This is the presenting symptom in nearly 75% of the patients in various series. And based upon this, several guidelines have been developed as to who should be investigated for presence of endometrial cancer in the presence of abnormal uterine bleeding. Now, it should be remembered that if a postmenopausal lady presents to you with postmenopausal bleeding, there is around a 5 to 10% risk that this patient may be having an endometrial cancer, especially if endometrial hyperplasia is also present. So, a patient who is postmenopausal or a younger age woman with a history of unopposed estrogen exposure, this may be exogenous estrogen. These may be in the form of ovarian tumors, and you may have to look at signs of estrogen exposure or illicit history of estrogen exposure in her. And presence of an endometrial thickness more than four to five millimeter in a postmenopausal lady are all conditions where you should suspect the presence of an endometrial cancer. The proper history as with a special emphasis on family history is important because these are often associated with presence of other malignancies, particularly of the breast and colon. Examination should be focusing on evaluation of the uterus size and shape, presence of mobility of the uterus, drawing nodes, and presence of free fluid in the abdomen. A transvaginal ultrasound is helpful to assess the endometrial thickness, the shape of the endometrial cavity, and the characteristic of the myometria, including making a note of if any fibroids or endometriomas are present. In postmenopausal women, if we use a cutoff of 5 millimeters for endometrial biopsy, that is, if the endometrial thickness is more than 5 millimeter and you consider it for biopsy, it has a sensitivity of 96% for picking up an endometrial cancer. But please remember, the probability of this test being positive is only 2.5% because vast majority of the patients do not have endometrial cancers. Nonetheless, it should not deter you from doing the appropriate biopsy in a patient who is postmenopausal and has presented with this thickening of the endometrium. Usually, this biopsy will be obtained in the clinic as an endometrial aspiration biopsy and will be done using a people's forcep in most of the situations, people's forcep-based biopsies are considered accurate enough to be used for diagnostic purposes, but they are able to sample an adequate amount of endometrium in only 60% of the patients. In case that is not possible for you, you should go ahead with a hysteroscopic biopsy. Dilatation and curettage is also another option, but hysteroscopic biopsy offers several advantages, particularly 
when you have got atrophic endometrium with a strong suspicion of malignancy, you can focus your biopsy on areas which are strongly abnormal on the hysteroscopy. And in presence of a polyp, you can do a concurrent polypectomy with the hysteroscopy. So usually in most cancer centers, hysteroscopic biopsy would be preferred if an endometrial aspiration biopsy is non contributed After the diagnosis is done, the most important test which you have to do is consider this patient for preoperative imaging. You of course have to do the routine blood parameters to determine her fitness for an anesthesia. MRI is usually the preferred approach for the initial workup, particularly an MRI of pelvis, which should ideally be contrast enhanced because it gives the most accurate evaluation of myometrial invasion, cervical involvement, parametrial and adenexal spread. If you are interested in knowing the exact figures of sensitivity and specificity for your exam purposes, take a look at this publication. CT abdomen is considered to be better for evaluation of nodes, but with more advanced MRI techniques being available, oftentimes an MRI of the whole abdomen may give you the information in one go. A chest X-ray would usually be considered, especially when you have got a low-grade endometrial adenocarcinoma, although the risk of metastasis is quite low. CT thorax is preferred in presence of high-grade histologies or if your MRI shows deep myometrial invasion. Modern-day staging of endometrial cancer is based upon surgical staging. And this is something that you have to keep in mind. At one point of time, endometrial cancers were not treated with surgery when anesthesia techniques were crude and a clinical staging system was actually available. But nowadays, most of your patients will be undergoing surgery and the appropriate surgical staging procedure should include a simple hysterectomy with a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy and nodal staging as required. And herein comes the importance of doing a preoperative biopsy and a proper imaging. Nodal staging is usually not required in low stage 1A grade 1, grade 2 tumors, which are predicted on the MRI. For other stages, however, a pelvic lymph node dissection and a paraortic lymph node dissection is done. Sentinel lymph node biopsy can be considered if expertise is available. And now there is adequate data regarding the safety of this technique especially in early stage endometrial cancers. Type B or C hysterectomies, which are more advanced forms of hysterectomies are considered only when there is a consideration to achieve an R0 resection. Omentectomy is usually reserved for patients who have serious carcinoma. While peritoneal cytology is usually sent, modern staging systems do not include this information in the staging, info, in the staging criteria. A word about the lymphatic tenopy in endometrial cancer. This is important because this is an important controversial topic. Now, GOG33 was the first study in, in 1987, which reported that nearly 11% of endometrial cancers may have nodal involvement. Later on, several studies, however, suggested that the risk, especially in low risk patients or early stage patients is quite low, even less than 1%. Two studies have been done, which are randomized control trials, which have evaluated the efficacy of lymphadenectomy versus no lymphadenectomy in early endometrial cancers. And all of them showed that endometrial cancer lymphadenectomy results in a higher risk of post-operative complications. There is limited or no impact on adjuvant therapy and the ASTEC trial is the trial that you should look to cite this. There is limited or no impact on the outcomes, that is survival. However, there is upstaging in 10 to 20% of the patients, which may impact your therapy decisions. Most cancer centers still advocate the use of lymph node staging to tailor adjuvant therapy, particularly, for example, in centers where there is adequate gynecological oncologic expertise available. This is a very useful and helpful chart, which tells us what is the risk of lymph node involvement in different types of uh, disease of the endometrium. This is from the Mayo Clinic and you can take a look at this publication. What is important for you to understand is that the risk of lymph node metastasis to the pelvis 
is actually high when you have got myometrial invasion more than 50%. And this is where the use of an MRI comes in really handy. Isolated paraortic metastasis is quite uncommon unless and until you have got a grade three tumor. And this is the situation where most oncologists would continue to recommend a paraortic lymphadenectomy, though the outcome improvement with the association with the use of a paraortic lymph node dectomy has not been proven in trials. Coming to the staging, this is the latest staging system that is used. I think most of you may be familiar with this. Stage one basically means a disease which is confined to the corpus of the virus. Stage 1a is considered when there is no or less than half of myometrial thickness involvement. And it is important to understand that at one point of time, stage 1a included only patients which did not have myometrial involvement. Stage 1b basically has more than or equal to half of myometrial thickness involvement. And this is why in a pathology report, you should look at the maximum extent of myometrial thickness that is involved, as well as the total thickness of the myometrium at this point to make a judgment if this has not been quantified by your pathologist. Stage two is presence of cervical stromal involvement in absence of adenoid cell involvement or vaginal involvement. Stage three is a setting where there is involvement outside the uterus. Stage 3A, when there is involvement of the cirrhosa, uterus, or adenexa. Stage 3B is when there is vaginal or parametrial invasion. And stage 3C is when there is involvement for vaginal uh, involvement of the pelvic or paraortic nodes. Stage 4 is reserved for organ invasion. So this can be in the form of bladder invasion or bowel invasion. Please remember for bowel, it should not be involvement of the extra mural, it should not be involvement of the wall, it should be involvement of the mucosa. Stage 4B is when there is involvement of other organs, including inguinal nodes. So this is often a favorite question of the examiners in the exam. This is quite simplified. Please go and take a look at the FIGO staging document to understand the nuances of staging for endometrial cancer in details. What is important in endometrial cancer is that therapy decisions are not exclusively based upon stage, unlike many other malignancies. And it is one of the few cancers where the staging is based upon risk stratification. The reason why this is done is because early stage endometrial cancers have a very favorable prognosis. So it is important to understand these risk groups are not only prognostic for outcome, but are also used for determining the type of adjuvant therapy. The well-defined risk factors are the type of pathological type, whether it is a classical endometrial cancer or other histologies, which includes clear cell, serous variants. And of course, you have MMT, which is also considered by many pathologists to be a type of endometrial cancer. Stage, depth of myometrial invasion, grade of the tumor, and presence of lymphovascular space invasion, particularly substantial lymphovascular space invasion. Age is also having a prognostic implication in many studies, but the biological reason why age has, a, uh, has this prognostic implication is not properly understood. It may be because age may have associations with therapy delivery, or it may so happen that the biological disease nature is driving this association. Nonetheless, many prognostic systems consider age to be important. Grade and LVSI together have independent prognostic information and therefore are used to divide the intermediate risk group. So this is how it works. You have the low risk group, which is primarily composed of stage one patients. Please remember these are stage one, not stage one A, who have grade one or two tumors with less than 50% myometrial invasion. So by modern staging, these will be stage 1A. They should not have lymphovascular space invasion and they should have the classic histology. Of course, nodes are negative. The intermediate stage is classified into confusingly an intermediate group and a high intermediate group. And the presence of lymphovascular space invasion or 
grade three is considered to be markers of a high intermediate risk in the country. When these both things are present, more than 50% myometrial invasion and grade three, classically, this would be considered as a high risk disease. Other stages like stage two, stage three are also considered as high risk disease. Now it is important to understand these risk groups because the type of therapy that you will give to these risk groups differs. Finally, we come up with the advanced disease, which basically includes stage three with residual disease and metastatic disease, which includes stage four with disease. However, with improved, uh, uh, so before we go in there, let's look at what is the implication of this risk stratification. The risk stratification works because it does segregate people into groups with differing prognosis. So high risk patients have got five year survivals in the range of around 60% or so. In contrast to that, low risk patients have got survivals in excess of 90 to 95%. High intermediate risk group patients usually have a survival in the range of 80 to 85% at five years. So this is important to understand and appreciate why this risk grouping came into account. And this is not based upon a single study. This is actually a product of multiple randomized controlled trials, which have investigated this issue in endometrial cancer. And we will be taking a look at some of them in the next few slides. With the advances in molecular pathology, there was a drive towards seeing whether this also results in better risk prediction. And using immunohistochemistry and a single molecular test, Wemji et al. have proposed an algorithm by which we can classify endometrial cancers into four risk categories. Now, please remember, these are not risk categories based upon your classical clinical pathological factors, but upon their presence of mutations and other features. So this is the flowchart. You first go ahead and do a poll testing. If your poll has a pathogenic mutation, which typically occurs in the P286R, V411L, S297F, and so on, and other two other locations are there, you consider it to be a poll mutated type of endometrial cancer. These endometrial cancers have an excellent prognosis. In poll wild type or non-pathogenic type of mutation, you classify whether they have MMR deficiency with the use of immunohistochemistry for one or more mismatch repair proteins, MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, and MSH6. If they are MMR deficient, they are considered to be the MMR deficient endometrial cancer. If they are proficient, you take a look at the P53 status. If the P53 is mutated, it is considered to be a P53 mutated type of endometrial cancer. And otherwise, all the rest fall in this basket category, which is known as no specific molecular profile or NSNP. This is quite similar to the triple negative breast cancer classification that we have in breast. And what about the implication of this risk stratification? This Stello et al. had first evaluated this risk stratification based upon molecular profiling in combined pathology specimens available in two important trials, Cortec-1 and Cortec-2, about which we will be hearing shortly. Cortec-1 had patients who had grade 1 or 2 tumors with deep myometrial invasion or grade 2, 3 tumors with superficial myometrial invasion. And Cortec-2 included high intermediate risk cohort. In these four categories, they found of the 947 patients, approximately 6% had poll mutations, 9% had P53 mutations, and 26% had MMR deficiency. So if you look at their outcomes, there is a clear-cut prognostic separation. Tumors with P53 mutation are associated with a very poor outcome with an overall survival in the range of 50 to 60 percent at five years. In contrast, tumors which are co-mutated, which are there in the blue at the top, 
are associated with an excellent prognosis to the tune of 85 to 90 percent. Please remember, in many of these endometrial cancers, the death at five years is not associated with endometrial cancer, but because of other factors. They found that in addition to the molecular profile, substantial lymphovascular space invasion and presence of more than 10% tumors with L1 cam mutation are associated with unfavorable profiles. Based upon this, recently in 2020, the risk stratification of endometrial cancer has been changed. If you do not have access to the clinical, to the molecular profile, the important changes that you must remember is the inclusion of non-endometrial histologies like serous and clear cell carcinomas who do not have myometrial invasion. Please remember this is not all stage A, but stage A without any myometrial invasion into the intermediate risk category. And stage two is also included now in the high intermediate risk group. Now it is not saying that the therapy of all of these cases should exactly follow the therapy of the other intermediate risk cases with a classical endometrial cancer, but it is important from the point of view of future studies and trials. If you do have the molecular profile, then it is important to remember that even when you have got a stage two tumor, which is cold mutated, the disease is considered as low risk. If you, on the other hand, have a TP53 mutation, then unless and until there is no myometrial invasion, there is always associated with a high intermediate or an advanced or a high risk disease phenotype. MMRD NSMP status do not make a difference to the risk grouping. So this is important to understand and appreciate. And why is this important? Because the risk grouping helps you determine how you should tailor your adjuvant therapy. For a low risk patient, the usual therapy is observation. I will deal with what exactly do you mean with observation shortly, but for now, just keep this in mind. Intermediate risk patients can be offered vaginal brachytherapy. High intermediate risk group patients who have undergone nodal staging can be offered BBT or external beam radiotherapy. And when they have not undergone nodal staging, the usual policy is to offer them external beam radiotherapy. A high risk patient, on the other hand, is usually treated with external beam radiotherapy along with chemotherapy. Now let us understand why these therapy recommendations came into place. The first is low risk. Why do not we consider any adjuvant therapy in these patients? This is because of this randomized controlled trial by Sorbet et al. who investigated whether addition of vaginal brachytherapy after surgery in low risk endometrial cancers resulted in an improved outcome. He randomized 645 patients and only 4% of the patients developed a recurrence. Although the use of vaginal brachytherapy reduced the risk of recurrence, but it did not translate into a survival advantage. And the overall risk of recurrence is so low that it is not considered sufficient for adjuvant therapy. Now, one very important thing to keep in mind over here is that to classify a tumor as a low risk, you need it to have the following characteristics. So go back. It should be a stage 1A disease, which means it is less than 50% of myometrial invasion. It should be a classic endometrial cancer pathology, and it should be grade 1 or 2 disease. So this is very, very important. And here, you should not have lymphovascular space invasion. If all of these features are met, not one of these features, if all of these features are met, then only you can consider this to be a low-risk disease. Now, in the West, most of your patients actually have a low-risk disease phenotype. This is actually not true in India. In our practice patterns, we find that most of our patients do not have a low-risk disease phenotype. Intermediate risk disease is the most common, and as I had mentioned before, intermediate risk disease is classified into two categories. One is an intermediate risk, 
and the other is a high intermediate risk. It's slightly counterintuitive, but that's what the way the risk classification is like. So there are three trials which have investigated whether there is any benefit of doing external beam radiotherapy in patients with intermediate risk disease. The citations are there for you in my presentation in the notes. The important finding from all of these is there is a reduction of external recurrence rate when you give external beam radiotherapy. Now, how much is this recurrence risk reduced? It depends to a significant extent on how was the risk profile of the patient, but nonetheless, approximately, you can see that the recurrence risk reduces by a half to one third. So this is important for you when you are counseling your patients. Please remember an important thing that intermediate risk patients without therapy, and especially if they have not undergone a pelvic lymph node dissection, do tend to have a 10% risk of recurrence. That is local regional this is very very important and this should be absolutely emphasized to your patients when you are counseling them however the use of ebrt in all of these studies did not translate into an improvement in overall survival or disease free survival and there was a significant increase in complication it was also noted from these studies that patients who had lymphovascular invasion patients who had deep myometrial invasion and patients who had grade 2 to 3 disease or who were older than 50 years age tended to derive maximum benefit from radiotherapy. And this is how the classification of high intermediate risk came into account. So if you must remember that when I said initially, people used to divide them into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. But this classification of a high intermediate risk actually developed from the findings of the GOG 99 study. Next, coming to the question whether an intermediate risk patient can be treated with DVT alone. To answer this question, there are two randomized controlled trials, Cortec 2 and the Swedish trial conducted by Sorbetol. Both of these showed that there were little differences in terms of outcomes when you did DVT alone as compared to EBRT. There is a slight improvement when you give EBRT as far as the local regional recurrence risk is concerned, but it is outweighed by the fact that the toxicity is substantially more, particularly chronic grade one, grade two toxicity. Now you may wonder why we are worried about grade one, grade two toxicities in this setting. The reason is grade one, grade two toxicities of radiotherapy, which are late toxicities tend to persist for the remaining part of the life. And many of these patients with a good prognosis tend to have other comorbidities like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, which tend to increase the morbidity produced by radiotherapy. Therefore, in the West, most patients with intermediate risk would be treated with BBT alone unless they are coming to a center where brachytherapy facilities are not available. So for your understanding, it is important to understand that patients who have an intermediate risk can be managed with vaginal brachytherapy alone, provided that you have had adequate surgical staging done. What about high intermediate risk? When should we consider external beam radiotherapy? Of course, when surgical staging is not performed. The reason we have evidence from the GOG 249 trial, which investigated the giving chemotherapy plus vaginal brachytherapy versus external beam radiotherapy alone in patients with high intermediate risk endometrial cancer. They showed that EBRT resulted in similar outcomes and CT resulted in excess toxicity, that is chemotherapy added to toxicity without improvement. And that is why in high intermediate risk, especially when surgical staging has not been done, you should proceed with external mean radiotherapy. The prognostic implication of substantial LVI has been brought out by secondary analysis from POTEC 1 and 2 studies, where they showed that when you give external beam radiotherapy to the patients with substantial LVI, your pelvic recurrence rate is only 5%. On the other hand, 
when there is substantial LDSI and you give external beam radiotherapy to stage two patients, your recurrent vaginal brachytherapy to stage uh, these patients, you get a recurrence risk of 25 to 30%. Stage two patients are a special consideration, although they are included in the high intermediate risk now. In most centers, they would still be treated with external beam radiotherapy. And in presence of cervical involvement, we tend to add brachytherapy also. What about the high-risk phenotype? High-risk phenotype requires the addition of chemotherapy and all of these patients need to be treated with external radiotherapy. Now let us look at the evidence behind the choice of this therapy. Sequential chemoradiation, that is giving chemotherapy either before or after radiotherapy has been investigated in two randomized controlled trials. One of them is the URTC NSGO trial, which had 380 patients. Another is the ILD3 study, which had 157. Now, the word mango means gynecological oncology group at the Mario Negri Institute. So it is not the acronym for the trial. Now, what happened was that these studies gave doxorubicin and, and cisplatin. And in the URTC trial, it was given after radiotherapy, while in the Iliad 3 trial, it was given before radiotherapy. They compared radiotherapy alone as the control arm. It is important to remember that there was around half of the patients had nodal staging. So this is very important when you are reading trials of endometrial cancer, you must remember that nodal staging makes a difference in terms of your volumes as we will shortly see. So what they found was that with the addition of chemotherapy, there was a significant improvement in the progression tree survival. However, overall survival did not improve. Since the distant metastasis risk had reduced with the use of chemotherapy, therefore, sequential chemotherapy and radiotherapy has become the choice of therapy in many centers worldwide. What about concurrent chemoradiotherapy? Concurrent chemoradiotherapy was investigated by the Fortec 3 trial. And this is an important trial for you to remember. What they did in this trial was that they recruited patients who had stage 1, grade 3 endometrial cancer with deep myometrial invasion or LBSI, or stage 2, stage 3 patients, or patients who had serous or clear cell histologies. They were treated with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, the concurrent chemotherapy being delivered in the dose of 50 milligrams per meter square twice during radiotherapy. It is important. Please remember that this concurrent chemoradiation regimen is not the same as the regimen that we use in cervical cancers. This was followed by four cycles of caroplatin and paclitaxel. They treated 686 patients and what did they find? They found that in the primary set, there was not much improvement in the outcomes with the use of concurrent chemoradiotherapy as compared to radiotherapy. And what happened was that in patients who had stage three disease, there was a significant improvement in the overall survival as well as the relapse free survival. These findings have been confirmed in their updated analysis with longer follow-up. And therefore, the Portec 3 approach of giving chemoradiation followed by adjuvant chemotherapy for four cycles is also followed in some centers. However, at Tata Medical Center, we are not following this approach. Finally, the question comes, what about giving, what is the added benefit of giving chemoradiation as opposed to chemotherapy? So this has been studied in four randomized control trials. The first trial was actually a very old trial at which time they used to give whole abdomen radiation for stage three, stage four endometrial cancer. Now you must remember that this was done at a time when surgical staging techniques were not so evolved and peritoneal disease was actually treated with radiotherapy, that is whole abdomen radiotherapy. They found that the use of chemotherapy, that is doxorubicin cisplatin for seven cycles followed by one cycle of cisplatin was actually superior to whole abdomen radiotherapy in terms of progression free survival and overall survival when you had this stage of disease. It is important to remember that cisplatin and doxorubicin is associated with substantial morbidity. 
and they had almost nine treatment related deaths in this arm whole abdomen radiation is also not very non toxic there were actually four treatment related deaths in the whole abdomen radiotherapy arm also. sorry to disturb uh, sorry to interrupt shantanda uh, only yes, 5 minutes uh, only 5 yes. minutes left actually sure sure i will hurry up ah, okay thank you sure so this is the important findings from these studies are that when you give chemotherapy along with ctrt you tend to have an improvement in the distant metastases but none of these studies have so far demonstrated an improvement in the overall survival because radiation is associated with better locorigital control it is still considered an important part of the therapy coming to ebrt volumes and dose it is important to remember that your target volume includes the proximal two thirds of the remnant vagina the paravaginal soft tissue and any pelvic lymph nodes when you are doing radiotherapy for endometrial cancer it is important to remember that all patients do not need coverage up to common iliac bifurcation in fact the common field that were used in the past had the superior border kept at the l5 s1 border you all know the use of intensity modulated radiotherapy and this has been convincingly demonstrated in the recently reported parser trial that the use of imrt is associated with substantial reduction in the late gi gu and vaginal toxicity however the use of imrt requires stringent quality assurance because treating the pelvis with imrt is not easy it is useful to consider using a bladder filling protocol because it reduces the variability our protocol is 500 ml of water to be taken 30 minutes before the radiotherapy after voiding the urine and this is what we follow for all pelvic malignancies brachytherapy is an important part of management in the adjuvant setting and you should remember that it is an important part in definitive setting for the few cases that you may see where surgery is not possible the objective of brachytherapy is to deliver high dose to the vaginal mucosa in the upper third to the upper half and the upper 2 to 4 cm is usually treated an usual dose schedule that is followed is 7 days in three fractions one week apart when you are treating only with brachytherapy when you are giving it adjuvant after external beam radiotherapy five days into two fractions or equivalent dose schedules are preferred finally coming to the toxicities of therapy you must remember that gi radiotherapy or radiotherapy to pelvis is associated with a common set of acute toxicities because of the radiation of the gi gu tract bone marrow late populations are important and for counseling purposes you should remember to counsel them about vaginal stenosis and shortening which happens in nearly 60% of the patients pelvic insufficiency fractures are a newly recognized class of complications known to occur in nearly 5% of patients patients who have undergone surgical staging can have lymphedema in 10 to 15% patients the summary and take home is that most endometrial cancers have a favorable prognosis when treated with modern techniques proper surgical staging is the keystone to the management and risk adaptive adjuvant therapy improves outcomes it is important to be realistic about the benefits of adjuvant therapy especially when you are counseling the patients you should remember to make sure that they understand that none of the adjuvant therapies that we use actually change the overall survival finally the integration of molecular prognosticators in the coming decades will potentially lead to a change in the way adjuvant therapy is done and with that i would like to once again thank you the organizers for inviting me to give this talk thank you dr shantum chakraborty for your excellent presentation dada thanks a lot thank you our next speaker is dr shopnendu basu and he will deal with uh, brachytherapy in cervical cancer there is one can uh, one question in the chat box i think we should take all the questions after finishing all the sessions sure okay, okay. thank you thank you shopnendu hello can you hear me yeah you are audible okay just a second
Okay. Is it visible? No. Yes, clearly visible, Dada. Okay. Uh, now, this is a very huge topic. So, I'll just go through the basics of bracket. I have been asked to emphasize more on intracavitary other than interstitial. So, let's start because it's already late. Our department in India first started in 1910 in medical college is the oft repeated image that we see every time. And radium tubes arrived by 1935 in medical college and we started brachytherapy for cervical cancers from then on. So the modalities of treatment that you have in radiation therapy are teletherapy, stereotactic, and others like 3D CRT, IGRT, IMRT, and a huge part is still dealt with brachytherapy. Brachytherapy means giving radiation within the tumor with sealed or non-sealed sources within the body. And it has a fast dose fall of in tissues due to the inverse square law, which is the ad greatest advantage of brachytherapy. And usually now that we are using brachytherapy in India, mostly our iridium and cobalt brachytherapy. So the clinical advantages in cervical cancer is a high biological efficacy, rapid dose fall of within millimeters, has a high tolerance rate and quite tolerable acute reactions. Due to its fast way of approach, it has this decreased risk of tumor repopulation, high control rate, better cosmosis, less morbidity, and it's a daycare procedure. But the pitfalls are difficult for inaccessible regions. Suppose a lymph node positive uh, cervical cancer, we cannot approach it by intracavitary or even interstitial. It is limited for small tumors. We'll be coming to that, that later. It is an invasive procedure, almost a surgical procedure, so you need a quite high amount of training, and it's done under anesthesia, either general or spinal. It has high dose in homogeneity, so it's difficult to control for very nearby organ at risk, and it has a very conformal approach. So if you do a bad implant, you totally miss the tumor altogether, and you have to remove the whole procedure as it is invasive. It becomes cumbersome. There may be severe complications and you have to redo the whole thing. So it's an art that you slowly progress to learn. Why intracavitative brachytherapy? This is because uterine cervix is ideally suited for it because of the high tolerance of cervix, uterus and the vagina. And it's a easily accessible organ, which we approach by the lithotomy approach through per vagina. And the endocervical canal and the vaginal vault are a suitable space where you can place the applicators and do a proper packing so that you can remove the organ at risk with minor modifications with uh, applicators that you can use universally for all the patients. So these are the tap type of applicators used, mainly Manchester and Fletcher is available in all of the centers. Some have ring applicators. The PGI Chandigarh has an applicator of its own. The VNA applicators are available too at few centers. The picture that you are seeing is a Fletcher applicator. You can notice it has three parts, two ovoids in the lateral parts and a uterine tendon. These are for interstitial implants. These are done with steel needles. These have templates. This is the Syed Neblet template that is used. And we have the Muppet or Martinez Universal Perineal Interstitial Template. These steel needles for implanting the lateral pelvic wall where it is involved. Now, 
the classification schemes in brachytherapy for cervical cancers are numerous. It's by the positioning of the radionuclide, the dose rate, or the duration of the radiation, and the loading pattern. So it can be interstitial or intracavitary by the approach that we use. It may be a temporary or permanent implant, which do not use in cervical cancers. It may be by the dose rate, low dose rate, medium dose rate, and the high dose rate, which you have to remember all throughout your life after you start your career as a radiation oncologist. There were previously manual afterloading systems and remote afterloading systems. We have used the manual afterloading system using the low dose rate in medical college, but that has been decommissioned already. We have all most probably remote afterloading systems now in India, and these have much more safety profile because the radiation hazard has been totally minimized. There are accurate placement. The treatment time is short, so percent of the applicators are less. We have better dose distributions and computer-based uh, planning optimizations in these. So going back to the ICRU 50, we have already seen most probably with the previous classes, uh, how our target volumes are defined. Here too, we will be defining the target volumes in different way, but it's the basic principle how you define the gross tumor volume that is the visible or demonstrable tumor either clinically and radiologically. The clinical target volume, which is the expected microscopic malignant disease and a planning target volume for inter and intrafraction errors. But in brachytherapy, as we pack the intracavitary applicators within the tumor, there is very less amount of movement. So in brachytherapy, the clinical target volume is equal to the planning target volume. So how does a brachy patient have its flow in a brachytherapy unit? First, you have to remember, mostly in cervical cancers, we have advanced disease. So there is nothing called brachytherapy alone in cervical cancers, very rarely. As we have seen in the previous uh, talk by Dr. Shantam Dr. Bhutte, that we can do vaginal cuff brachytherapy alone in endometrial cancers. But here, we generally combine it with concurrent chemo radiation followed by brachytherapy. So the mostly we complete the external beam radiotherapy and then start our brachytherapy. So once a treatment decision is done, we determine what is to be done, either uh, intracavitary replacement or a uh, interstitial. After that, we implant the sources in the th operation theater under general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia. Then we have to acquire the images either by X-rays, CT scans, or MRI. Then the treatment plan is generated and optimization done, and we commence treatment immediately. The applicators are removed and the patient is discharged. This is the flow pattern in a brachytherapy. So we have to have a proper bowel preparation first with bladder and the bowel prior to brachytherapy. The proper bladder protocol that has already been discussed before, then anesthesia and sedation. So previously you have to have a uh, pre-anesthetic checkup to see any medical problems for the patient. Then the applicator selection, whether you have areas where you can put your applicators, especially the ovoids in the lateral furnaces, which can be taken up by the tumor itself and due to lack of response where you cannot place the ovoids properly. If you cannot find the os properly, it's very difficult to negotiate the uterine tandems. So you have to plan for interstitial then. That is an innovation or you have a combination of intracavitary with needle placement in the VNA applicators. 
you may have USG guidance if it's available in your center for look. in your brachytherapy. More and more in your courses to come on, you have to have a clinical drawing of what your tumor is that is at diagnosis and at every brachytherapy procedures. So you have brachytherapy one, brachytherapy two, or even up to four, whatever schedules that you are using, and you have to properly mark what your clinical findings are. This is your first imaging and you have to properly record them. Then you do whatever you, is available to you, a CT scan or an MRI. MRI is always better for localizing your tumor, but if you do not have that already, there are recommendations about CT guided brachytherapy. So now you implant at the OP, you place the uterine tandem first within the uterine cavity and place the ovoids in the lateral fornices. Then you properly pack so that you remove the rectum away from the posterior fornices and above the bladder from away from the anterior vaginal wall. Then image acquisition, the basics that you use is a CM with an X-ray. Uh, you can see a box out here. This is for the orthogonal X-rays. It's a orthogonal box method. You have different methods of reconstructing an X-ray image, or you can have a dedicated CT scan or even an MRI. For MRI, you have to have titanium applicators. Otherwise, you won't be able to do it without a CT scan. So, so a few of our centers do have MRI uh, compatible applicators where you can use MRI. And this is a typical cervical implant. You can see multiple channels that are going through the needles, steel needles inside a uh, patient with interstitial implant, which is being treated. So steps of planning after the in insertion, you get the image equation. Then the image is registered in your treatment console and visualized in the CT or MR. Then you delineate your target volumes and organic risk. You do your catheter reconstruction and source loading within the catheters. Then you optimize your plan and see the plan evaluation is the same flow in, as in an external beam radiation also. You see the DVHs, you are satisfied with your dose and the organite risk doses, then you execute your plan. So first you pre-plan. Again, the clinical drawing, and this is after the implant with a orthogonal X-ray, a lateral X-ray and an AP view. This is how we previously used to do. All are basically shifting to image-guided brachytherapy right now, and most of the departments are doing away with this X-ray-based planning systems. But still, we have to look at it historically. Once the X-ray is acquired, we have a digitizer which calculates the implant geometry and transfer it into the computer. And then we can calculate the total dose of external beam and brachytherapy, and we plan according to some points which we will be discussing, so that the total dose of EBRT and brachytherapy is calculated for your treatment plan. What and Meredith first defined a point, it is called the point A, which is a historic definition, which is Latin canal and two centimeters superior to the mucosa of the lateral fornix in the plane of the uterus. But as it is not visible, now point is A is defined as a point two centimeter above the distal end of the lowest source in the cervical canal. 
that is in the external os where you keep a marker and lat two centimeter lateral to the center of the tendon that is here so we still keep this, this point a even in our image guided brachytherapy and point b b is defined more laterally three centimeter from the point a which gives us the dose to the lateral pelvic wall and we define the bladder and rectal points the fallacy with these points are in point a based regime we will come to uh, volume based regimes right now uh, the dose to point a is actually lower than what we get and we define the bladder and rectal points uh, to define uh, to check for your organate risk uh, doses so you have a foley's catheter with dye filled up up to 7 cc and pull it down to your bladder neck and from the central point you put a perpendicular back project and the central point from the ap view this cuts to the bladder point bladder reference point similarly from the midway between the vaginal sources you go 0.5 centimeter posteriorly to your rectal reference point these also are surrogates which give you a lower dose than the rectal doses that we calculate right now you can also go to the lymphatic trapezoid and other points that are there we won't be going into details because you will be reading it in your textbooks because time is short here now we have moved into volume the gynecological jet gastro group has defined different risk volumes like the high risk ctv the intermediate risk ctv and the low risk ctv so the high risk ctv is your whole cervix along with the macroscopic tumor other than the cervix and with an mri with the gray zones the intermediate risk ctv is your first clinical target volume that you got during your diagnosis and your mri at that time which has regressed from your external beam radiation. That is your intermediate risk CTV. And the rest, the potential microscopic spread is your low risk CTV. So your aim is to give high dose as possible to the high risk CTV. And for the intermediate risk CTV, you should at least have a dose of 60 gray. This is with your brachytherapy plus external beam radiation therapy. So this is the concept of high risk CTV and intermediate risk CTV. This is the GTV B or B1 say, that is your gross tumor volume during brachytherapy one. Along with that, you have your gray zones, that forms your high risk CTV. Along with that, you have a 10 millimeter margin to create your intermediate risk CTV. The ORA, OAR contouring principles are from at least two centimeter below your intermediate risk CTV to two centimeter above the uterus. So you contour the outer bladder wall, outer rectal wall, the rect rectosigmoid jun junction, and at least two centimeters above the para, and also contour the bowel loops three to four centimeters from the uterus and applicators. You also have a vaginal reference point that has a high steep dose gradient. So you also calculate this rectovaginal reference point. This is how a CT looks like after a proper Manchester application. You can see the central tandem. This is the AP view. And these are the two ovoids in the lateral fornices. And you have already packed the rectum and bladder. You can see it in the lateral view. This is your bladder in the anteriorly and your rectum posteriorly. The fallacy with point-based system was you didn't have a sigmoid point, which later on 
has been developed, but in a CT or MR based, you can see the sigmoid and most problematic part is the organet risks more at risk is the sigmoid which falls on top of your uterine tantrum, which you cannot see in orthogonal x-rays. This is a 3D reconstruction of your three applicators in position with the isodose volume covering your high risk CTV and intermediate risk CTV. This is a typical can that you see after the reconstruction has been done. So after this, we go for your, you can see the bladder out here delineated here. This is an interstitial implant with multiple needles out here and see how steep gradient there is that the posterior bladder wall and the anterior rectal wall has been saved by optimizing. This is a typical interstitial applicator application. So what is optimization? In HDR brachytherapy planning, most common optimization process determine the dwell times that produce the desired dose distribution with the catheters and are in position. So you can do a geometric optimization. It's to give a uniform dose distribution around your target volumes. And this is how it is done. You can see the dwell times, that is where your source position is and how much it will be staying there and radiating. So you optimize this to have a proper isodose that saves your organ at risk and gives a proper dose to your target volume. This is a typical dose volume histogram that you see after you optimize. You see the organ at risk out here, bladder, the rectum, sigmoid, and everything. You, you can also do a volume optimization, point dose optimization, this is a plan which no optimization, all have equal dwell times. Now you start optimizing to a reference point. So manually you can drag and draw these different dwell positions to do it, but mind it, when you drag all these uh, dwell times, you have to check all the slices because check, if you just check one slice, you may be landing up with a very high dose in a different slice. So slice by slice, you have to optimize all the slices until you have a proper optimized plan so that you don't have a high, very high dose at your own organ at risks. So this is a properly optimized plan that has been done. So how do you evaluate a plan? Till now, we still see the point A dose, though we are going to talk about image-guided adaptive brachytherapy. Do we see the per fraction dose? Mostly no nowadays, because you will be having different sorts of regimes at different places, like uh, most use 50 gray in 25 fractions for external beam or 50.4 gray in 28 fractions or even 45 gray in 25 fractions for lower stage of disease and have different brachytherapy schedules, right? Seven gray in four fractions to nine gray in two fractions. So we have this concept of EQD2, we'll come to it later. And later on, you can calculate all these to actually evaluate your plan. So there are target dose constraints to the HRCTV, IRCTV and the GTV, the high risk CTV, we have concepts of D90, that is the volume, which is getting 90 gray of dose. We have dose constraints to the organ at risk, right? the rectal wall and the bladder wall and the sigmoid colon, where we see the 2 cc and 0.1 cc and even the 5 cc doses. 
we see different plans side by side. You can do two, three plans and uh, choose your plan. You have to report, track, and QA. So we also have taken to consideration the overall treatment time. When you are giving uh, external beam radiation, uh, this is the BED, the biological effective dose. And if you prolong your treatment too much, this factor that you see, which is subtracted, it is due to the potential doubling time or due to the tumor proliferation. So if you protract your treatment too much, you will be land up losing one gray per day almost. This is the BD for brachytherapy. Mostly during LDR, we used to have a long treatment time and this part of the treatment used to get subtracted. In HDR, this is not much of a problem and we add this up. So your aim is to complete brachytherapy by eight weeks of time. So you may have a question that can we interdigitate that we can start brachytherapy while uh, going on with external beam radiation. The problem is you can start, but it is uh, prudent to know that if your volume is too large, you may not encompass it while doing an intracavitary. So we prefer to uh, complete the five weeks of treatment and then start intracavitary. So this is the two day, two gray dose equivalent that we calculate with different fractions of external dream and your brachytherapy schedules so that you get an idea of what will be your ISO effective dose that is changed into two gray per fraction. So even in nine gray two fractions, seven gray four fractions, you have a ISO effective dose, which you can have a LQ spreadsheet and actually calculate and use it in your uh, department. And you have different constraints for that. Like for HRCTV, I have already said it's 90 gray for uh, D90. And uh, for your 0.1 and 2 cc volumes, you have different constraints for your rectum, sigmoid, and bladder. Uh, previously, we used to keep it around 90 and 75 gray, respectively, for the bladder and rectum and sigmoid. But we are trying to keep it much lower than that 85 gray for bladder and 65 gray for rectum and sigmoid. So also you have to see the dose volume histograms. We have mostly cumulative and differential dose volume histograms. These are typical dose volume histogram that you will see. And you evaluate the plan accordingly. You see the dose OAR doses. And after you are satisfied with your cumulative DVHS, then only you approve your plan. These are the typical uh, data that come during your planning. This is a planning console, and you have a different treatment console where you put the patient after your plan evaluation and are satisfied with it, start your treatment. Now, during those calculation, one thing has to be um, kept in mind, then other than acuros, uh, usually no contours of organs or the patient surface are considered. So no inhomogeneity corrections are applied. It is equal in all sides other than the acuros planning system. So this is bit different from what you see in photon beam. And this is the AAPM PG43, how the formalism is used for calculating the dose in brachytherapy. Now, just briefly, we are moving from the ICRU report 38 that you saw about point A and rectal point, bladder point, the ICRU 38, to image guided adaptive brachytherapy which is the ICRU 89 that we are currently trying to follow. So numerous recommendations are there. You can go through the uh, uh, publications 
one by one. So if you see here, what happens in adaptive brachytherapy, you have a volume in the left side of the parametrium, which you cannot encompass by the intracavitary application. So Hello, Sapnanada. You are not audible. Sapnanada, are you there? Maybe they are in some network issues. Let's wait for some time. Am I audible now? Yeah, audible and visible, both. Okay. Uh, we were in this slide, right? Excuse me? Arundhuti? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay, so these are the different scenarios that you have. The best is uh, MR always. If you don't have that MR with CT or a clinical examination, or a CT and a CT at every application. Now, there was a question posed that can IMRT replace brachytherapy in cervical cancer? See, the history that we have seen given the excellent efficacy and tolerance of modern brachytherapy, till now, uh, there is no data to actually replace brachytherapy. At best, IMRT could provide a potential fallback for patients who are unable or unwilling to receive brachytherapy because of medical reasons or we cannot do anesthesia. There is a comparison between image graded brachytherapy versus IMRT versus <coughs> intensity modulated proton therapy. But you see that in IMRT and the integral dose is quite high and uh, the pitfalls is that are we asking the right question? Because everywhere uh, the publications that have been done are with four field box with image guided brachytherapy uh, along with IMRT versus IMRT. So if we can use both together and do a bone marrow sparing IMRT and add IMRT to pelvic nodes and 
lateral pelvic walls, al along with image guided adaptive brachytherapy, I think that will be the best solution till date. So let's wait. I don't think um, the results that we are right now seeing from the retro MBS study and the MBS study one. See the three year uh, data right now is uh, pelvic control rates of almost 98 to 100%. And especially for early stage, stage one, stage two diseases. And even for stage three, stage four, it are about 73 to 86%. That is 10% increase in overall survival rates. So as for now, HDR brachytherapy, especially intracarabinary is here to stay. Uh, let's wait for the further publications that we are right now going through. Maybe in a few years time, we will be having more data to change our practice till now. Thank you. Hello, Runadidi? Yeah, yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, you are already yes. Yeah, actually, there is some connection problem. <laughs> Should we start the next session? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, uh, the next session is uh, man management of other gynecological cancers, and it will be dealt by Dr. Obhishek Basu, Jr. Dr. Obhishek, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, should I have to uh, share my slide or you will do that? Yes, yes, you can do share screen. Okay, so just a minute now. Is the slide visible now? Yeah, visible. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, ARY West Bengal, for giving me this opportunity. And, and I'm extremely blessed to uh, share this platform with Shantam sir and Shopnendu sir. Now, today, I will be discussing um, some, some points in regards of management of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, outline of management of vulval cancer, and outline of management of the vaginal cancer. Now, to begin with, what is GTN or GTD? Now, gestational trophoblastic disease refers to a group of benign and malignant tumors that develop in the uterus from the placental tissue. Now, the pathogenesis of GTD is unique in that maternal tumors arise from the gestational tissue that can have locally invasive or even have a metastatic potential. Now, the classification as laid down by the WHO, it may be classified into broad, broadly two categories. First is the malignant neoplasm of various types of trophoblast that includes Choriocarcinoma, placental side trophoblastic tumor, and epithelial trophoblastic tumor or ETT. And the second one is the malformations of the chorionic villi that are predisposed to develop the trophoblastic malignancies, most commonly known as a hydrodiform moles or H mole. And it, it can be divided into the partial H mole, complete H mole, or the invasive H mole. Now, uh, we are all aware to a uh, great extent with this H mole during our uh, final year MBBS or even uh, during our gynae internships. Now, how 
did uh, how uh, a mole is developed so if we just know the basic pathology then we will be able to understand that which one is what now the complete mole has no fetal tissue within it it is uh, like a uh, sperm is fertilizing an empty ovum that is a ovum without its nucleic acid and after the chromosome duplication it becomes a complete mole and with a chromosome number of 46 xx it may be a dispermy also when the two sperm fertilize a empty ovum and that can give rise to either 46 xx or 46 xy but in both of these cases there is no fetal tissue within the mole whereas in the partial mole the ovum has its nucleic acid and it has been fertilized by the two sperm and that can give rise to 69 triple x double xy or even x double y now the partial mole the fetal tissues are present but the complete mole the fetal tissues are absent and the whole uterine cavity is been filled by the grape like structures or clusters now now uh, what is the difference uh, it is uh, one of our long questions during our final mbbs gynecological examination so i will not be dealing in detail because we are already running short of time but to know is that in the partial mole it is fetal fetus is often present but in complete mole it is absent and how do they uh, clinically present partial mole will present with a missed abortion whereas the complete mole present with a molar gestation the uterine size is small for dates or small for dates for the partial mole and it is 50% large for dates for the complete mole fecal lutein cyst is rare but it is around 25 to 30% cases fecal lutein cyst are present in the complete mole now the complete mole patient present with vaginal bleeding large for dates uterine size bilateral fecal lutein cyst medical complications and beta ecg often rises more than 1 lakh milli international unit per ml and it can give rise to around 15 to 20% of the postmolar gtn now what is a postmolar gtn uh, we will um, discuss it few uh, slides later and the partial mole it is firstly treated with a uh, dilatation and curettage and and diagnosis usually is incomplete or missed abortion medical complications are rare and beta ecg rarely shoots above more than 1 lakh and only less than 5% can give rise to a postmolar gtn or gestational trophoblastic neoplasia now the staging um, as for the figo staging for for gtn this slide has been taken from the latest nccn guideline now the stage 1 is tumor confined to the uterus stage 2 tumor extends to the other genital structure like ovary tube vagina etc by metastasis or even by direct extension the stage 3 is lung metastasis and stage 4 is all other distant metastasis other than lungs now how a gtn presents clinically the presentation of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia can vary depending upon the antecedent pregnancy event the disease type and extent now the postmolar gtn including the invasive mole or choriocarcinoma can be associated with irregular vaginal bleeding and enlarged and irregular uterus and even a bilateral ovarian enlargement abdominal mass with varying degree of lower abdominal pain expulsion of grapes like material is a very frequent complaint by the patients now the trophoblastic tumor have a fragile vessels pathologically so as a result metastatic lesions are often hemorrhagic x ray chest may show secondaries in the form of cannon balls or snow storm appearance typically 
present in uh, patients of choriocarcinoma. Not all, but uh, to a fair extent. And the USG pelvis may show the characteristic snowball appearance. So these are all uh, the, the things we have read before during our final MBBS or even uh, during our NEET PG preparations. Now, how do we work up a patient of GTM? Firstly, we have to uh, take detailed history and physical examination, then go for the routine uh, blood investigation like CBC and biochemistry profile, including LFT and renal function test. Then we have to uh, under uh, then we have to procure a beta ACG assay. Now, in form of imaging. We would advise CECT of thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. And pelvic USG or MRI may be uh, advocated in fewer, fewer patients. But most commonly, we do a metastatic workup in the form of contrast enhanced CT scan of thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. Now, MRI brain or CECT brain is uh, recommended by NCC in 2021 if the, the patient has pulmonary metastasis. So in those patients, there is a higher risk of brain metastasis. So to diagnose or to exclude that, you should be uh, careful for, uh, for MRI brain or even a CECT brain. Then definitely a histopathologic assessment. And we have to, um, uh, we have to just map our patient in view of determining the FIGO stage and the prognostic score. Now, GTN is such a disease that only staging will not help you uh, in choosing the treatment options. So there is a prognostic score that is equally and, uh, and, and sometimes it is more important than staging also. So what is the prognostic score for GTN? So it is sometimes asked in the final MD examination also and also uh, comes as a long question or short note. Now the risk uh, scoring of the GTN, we have, uh, we have eight prognostic factor. They have been attributed a score of 0, 1, 2, and 4. And based on this, we have to score the patients. Now, now the prognostic factors are age. Second is antecedent pregnancy. And in the interval from the index the pregnancy in months, then the pretreatment or baseline beta, uh, yes, pretreatment or baseline beta ACG, the largest tumor size, including the uterus, site of metastasis, lung, it is for zero, spleen or kidney, it is one, GI tract, it is two, and if it is a brain metastasis or liver metastasis, it is the worst prognosis, so it has a score of four. Number of metastases is also important and previous failed chemotherapy cycles. So after that, if the score is less than seven, it is low risk. And if it is seven or more than seven, it is a high risk. Now, how will you manage a case of GTN with this scoring? Uh, firstly, um, yeah. Now the systemic therapy for GTN for low risk, the single drug agent is uh, generally recommended either in the form of IV methotrexate or IV dactinomycin. Now, methotrexate is a multi-day methotrexate regimen is typically used as a first line therapy for low risk GTN. And, and due to its toxicity profile, five-day dactinomycin has most often been used as a secondary therapy for patients with methotrexate toxicity or effusions contradicting the use of methotrexate. So if a patient develops uh, toxicity or he or she, uh, or, or she is clinically contraindicated to use the uh, methotrexate, we can choose dactinomycin. But, but most commonly, five-day methotrexate with a dose of 0.4 mg per kg body weight per day with a maximum of 25 mg per day IV for five days and repeat after 14 days is generally recommended 
for low risk GTM, which have a FIGO prognostic score less than seven. If we use dactinomycin, then we will be using the in the dose of 10 to 12 microgram IV daily for five days and the cycle repeats after 14 days. Now, now the uh, question arises that how long a patient should be treated with this chemotherapy. For low risk, it is single agent. For high risk, it is multi-agent IMACO. And IMACO, I think uh, most of us have been acquainted with this term. Now the IMACO is etoposide, methotrexate, and dactinomycin, or actinomycin D is for A4. So IMACO is, uh, so basically IMACO is divided in IMA and CO. Now the IMA part has been delivered or is, is given on day one and day two with this dose regimen. I think, uh, I think you can read by yourself only. And the CO part, that is the cyclophosphamide and the oncoborine are given on day eight. And this cycle repeats every 14 days. And with each cycle, beta ACG has to be measured. Now, how long this chemotherapy cycles for low risk, it is single agent. For high risk, it is multi-agent like IMACO should be given. So for that, we have to serially monitor the beta ACG. Here lies the importance of beta ACG. So firstly, beta ACG is importance in the diagnosis of GTM. Now the beta ACG assay every two weeks at the start of each treatment cycle for monitoring. Regimens are continued until two to three full cycles past normalization of ACG. Suppose you are giving a young lady three or four cycles of, of IMACO if she's having a high risk or high, high score GTN. Now, uh, even after three or four cycle or maybe even after two cycle, the beta SCG level gradually lows down to the normal level. So when beta SCG uh, just, just lowers down to the normal level from that cycle, you have to add three more cycle of IMACO for high risk or single agent methotrexate for low risk for the treatment completion. Now the beta ECG assay every month for 12 months for following up a case of low and high risk GTN. So here is the follow up. The first issue was that how long we should use the chemotherapy. And the answer is the two to three full cycles past normalization of beta ECG. And how long beta ACG should be followed, should be serially monitored in a case of low or high risk, it is monthly for 12 months. Now, if beta ACG rises serially, it indicates either persistence or recurrent GTN, which require further systemic management. Because if some, if we uh, come across drug resistant choriocarcinoma or drug resistant GTN, then for, for, for then we have miscellaneous drug like EP followed by IMA. Now in the EP is the etoposide and cisplatin are given on day one. And IMA is also uh, means etoposide, methotrexate and actinomycin D for day one and day two. So these are the treatment strategies for drug resistant or salvage therapy for recurrent GTN. Now, firstly, recurrent GTN is always start with a re-challenge of IMACO. If IMACO still fails, then EP followed by IMA or triple MAC, that is methotrexate, dactinomycin, in chlorambucil is not often used, but there are uh, some, some op options also. Now, what is a beta ECG? Play two. Now, ACG play two during treatment can be defined as a less than 10% decrease in ACG over three treatment cycles. Now, what is the importance of this beta ACG play two? We will be discussing later in the form of postmolar GTN. Now, the post treatment imaging, lastly, the post treatment imaging is not recommended for follow up after ACG normalization in patients with postmolar GTN or choriocarcinoma where the ACG is a reliable tumor marker. 
So you follow up with ECG only. Generally, uh, no imaging is recommended if the ECG is normal. So um, here is the salivase therapy as I was discussing a few seconds earlier, that is EMA followed by EP. And for the, and for the residents, whenever you are using EMACO, always give a filgastrin support of the patient. Uh, generally, it is given even after the first day one, day two. So you should start on day three, four, and five. And after the day eight treatment CO, again, you can use three-day GCSF or if your hospital uh, provides big filgastrim or the patient depot, then a single dose of the PEG GCSF is advocate for preventing the neutropenic fever. Now, how, uh, now how to follow up evaluation of the molar pregnancy? Now, now, firstly, we should counsel the patient that yes, you should prevent pregnancy for a minimum period of six months using hormonal contraception. Monitor serum ACG levels every two weeks. Serial measurement of ACG is important to detect the trophoblastic neoplasia. Chemotherapy is not indicated as long as this serum level continue to regress. A rise or persistent play two in the level demands evaluation for GTM. An increase signifies trophoblastic proliferation that is most likely malignant unless the woman is pregnant again. So it is how to follow up a molar pregnancy. Once the ACG levels falls to a normal level, test the patient monthly for six months, then follow up is discontinued and pregnancy is allowed. So mark this point, pregnancy is allowed after normalization of beta HCG for an additional six months, then pregnancy is allowed and estrogen, progestin contraceptive or depot MDP usually are used to prevent a subsequent pregnancy during the period of surveillance. Now what happens if a patient is pregnant after a GTN? Follow-up surveillance is minimally six months for molar pregnancy as discussed uh, earlier, one year for GTN for both low risk and high risk and up to two years for cases with metastasis other than lung, that is it may be liver, it may be brain, then you have to follow for, uh, you, you have to follow up for at least two years. There is no difficulty with fertility or normal pregnancy outcome following successfully treated GTN. Women who have been given chemotherapy do not have an increased risk for anomalous fetuses in the subsequent pregnancy, provided six months of contraception was strictly advocated. The primary concern is that the women who had gestational trophoblastic disease are at increased risk for developing it again in a subsequent pregnancy. Now, what is the post-molar GTN? As per the FIGO and NCCN criteria, we will diagnose a case of post-molar GTN if the ACG level play two for four consecutive values over more than three weeks. ACG level rise more than 10% for three values over more than two weeks. And ACG persist in six months or more after molar evacuation. What are the surgical options? So, Firstly, you have to remind that H mole is generally treated with primarily DNC. First, a uh, patient come with a missed abortion, you diagnose molar pregnancy. You have to just uh, you have to just evacuate the mole by DNC, that is dilatation and curatage. Post that, if if the patient's beta ECG level is platus or do not fall back even after six months. So we are diagnosing it is a post-molar GTN. For post-molar GTN, 
we can use either repeat dilatation and curettage or a hysterectomy. Now, hysterectomy with salpingectomy may be considered if there is localized disease in the uterus that is in a stage one and where the fertility preservation is not desired. Leave the ovaries in situ even in the presence of theca lutein cyst. Adjuvant surgical procedure for chemotherapy, resistant disease, it may be adjuvant, it may be salvage also, may be required to manage the high risk disease. Select patient with isolated disease may be candidate for surgical resection. If it is a surgically, if it is isolated recurrence in the uterus or lungs. PET CT imaging may be useful for detecting isolated metastatic sites that are amenable to targeted surgery. And lastly, the selective arterial embolization can be used to manage the bleeding from the uterus or vagina or from other tumor sites. Now, very briefly, what is the management of CA valva? It is the FIGO staging and you will read by yourself. I will not be going into details. Stage-wise management of CA valva, 1A, 1A means that is the tumor is less than or equal to 2 centimeter with less than or equal to 1 mm depth of invasion and N0. 1A is treated by radical valvectomy or even wide local excision if it is void lateralized as it is the N0, there is no need to uh, no need to address the node by the surgically or other methods. Now the 1B, now the basic, basic difference is 1A and 1B. It is in, in between size and depth of invasion. Both are N0. In 1B, after radical valvectomy, we are doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. If the sentinel lymph node is positive, then bilateral inguinal femoral lymph node dissection or at least inguinal lymph node dissection is advised. For stage two, it is radical valvectomy with unilateral or bilateral inguinal dissection followed by plus minus adjuvant artery. Now, what are the indications of adjuvant artery? As per UCLA data, it is either positive or closed surgical margin, LVSI, depth of invasion more than 5 to 10 mm, size more than 4 centimeter, and if it is an infiltrative pattern. So these are the indications for adjuvant artery. And stage 3 and 4A are is treated uh, up to 4A. It is radical valvectomy, bilateral inguinal lymph node dissection, followed by adjuvant CTRT. Adjuvant CTRT means weekly cisplatin with a 40 mg per square meter that is we are using in CA in cervix case also. For stage 4B, palliative CT or palliative RT is indicated. Unresectable CA valva or valvular cancer is treated in the line of CA cervix advanced or locally advanced case that is definitive CTRT. Now, what are the doses? The doses as per NCC or the ACR consensus, if we are using the primary RT dosing, after R0 resection, it is 45 to 50.4 gray. For close margin, it is 56 to 60 gray. For R1 resection, it is 63 to 66 gray. Or for gross residual or unresectable disease, is around 64.8 to 70 gray. Lymph node dosing, uh, see, 45 gray to bilateral groin nodes and the pelvic nodes may boost to the involved node also. And if there is an extracapsular extension, then 62. 65 gram and by planning preferably by intensity modulation modulated radiotherapy that is IMRT. Now how will you manage a vaginal cancer? Now CA vagina is also presenting like a patient of CSRV vaginal bleeding and growth ulcer proliferative growth etc and, and it is the stage and um, shortly uh, describing the stage-wise management. For stage one, where the vaginal mucosa is only involved, you are, you are treating with either surgery only or brachytherapy in the form of vaginal cylinder brachytherapy. If it is more than 5 mm deep or more than 2 centimeter uh, dimension of the tumor or grade 3, you may add lymph node dissection or whole pelvic artery. Grade um, 
stage one the vaginal cancer have an excellent five year dfs of 90% uh, with a adequate pelvic control also now the stage 2 where the submucosa or the paravaginal tissue is involved for stage 2 whole pelvic rt to 45 gram cis platin based chemotherapy weekly then vaginal cylinder brachytherapy 6 gram into 3 fraction hdr with a, with a total dose of 75 gram and stage 3 also treated in the same line of stage 2 that is more or less like like service there are 45 to 50 gram whole whole pelvic rt by vrt and brachytherapy uh in the form of cis gray into three fractions now the stage 4 for bladder stage 4a is bladder and rectum and 4b is for distal metastasis now 4b is treated with palliative chemotherapy now what is the abs recommendation for brachytherapy in ca vagina based on based on location if the apex if the tumor reside in the apex and it is less than 0.5 cm use icrt icrt means here vaginal cylinder only if it is more than 0.5 cm you have to give a ebrt dose or interstitial boost now the mid vagina interstitial therapy for anterior or lateral if the posterior or massive use the ebrt boost distal uh distal is confined lesions gets interstitial massive tumor needs ebrt boost now who should get vaginal cylinder alone very superficial disease less than 0.5 cm thickness who should get the interstitial brachytherapy apically located well defined mobile and more than 0.5 cm thick who gets chemo stage 3 onwards and any high risk disease that's all for today thank you thank you dr abhishek for your excellent presentation uh, regarding the question answers uh, there was uh, three questions in the chat box that has been already answered there is only one question by dr debarjan kundu for dr abhishek dr abhishek are you there yes yes yeah the question is uh, is there any quantum of reduction of beta hcg level that can be considered significant for good response following chemotherapy cycle generally um they uh, then the guideline says that the beta hcg level should be fall back below the normal range or even a one log of the value so we are when we are uh, using a uh, when we are we are evaluating a patient of gtn we are monitoring the serial levels of beta hcg to check whether it is um, below the normal or within that within the normal range is there any other question from anyone if there is no other question i think uh, we can conclude the session right kajida shuranjan anyone is there yeah you can conclude okay so for today so our next class will be on uh, 5th march it will be on gi cancer so there will be two sessions one in 5th and one is 13th So GI uh, day one and day two. Okay, so with that information, we are concluding the session. Thank you all who are uh, present in the session, and I uh, give big thanks to the all the esteemed speakers for their wonderful presentation. Thank you.